Guys, this is kind of a weird video from me, but what hasn't been lately? Today, I am going to be doing my laundry while we chat because it has piled. And I don't do my laundry very often. I'm a live out of laundry baskets type of person. I just sort through it as I need it. Like I literally just rifle through like this, like, oh, I need a bra. That's what I do, um, and it's driving me bananas. Uh, Zach and I actually spoke this morning. We were on our way to get a coffee, and I was like, do you think people just like genuinely feel happy? He was like, okay, that makes me really sad. What do you mean? And I was like, it's not that I'm not happy. It's that I always feel overwhelmed by the stuff that I have to do. Like I feel like I'm never caught up or like I'm never on top of everything. Like if one area of my life, I feel like I'm doing well and everything else is falling apart. And he was like, I honestly just think that that's like, individual to the person and you know you just have to accept parts of yourself that are and then like try to work on other parts of yourself but this is one part of me that i feel like if i got under control i would be feeling a lot less bogged down this laundry like i've got five baskets here full of clean laundry and this is just how they sit so today what i'm gonna do put them away i'm gonna fold them and put them away and i haven't done this in months i i do the laundry quite often I just don't ever do anything with it. So so I thought I would just sit down and chat with you guys while I do that. I also wanted to talk to you guys about my anniversary, not my wedding anniversary, which did just pass by the way. 17 years we've been together, 17 years. And 12 years married, so that did just pass. And I can't even believe it. It feels like we've, I mean, we literally have been together for more than half of our lives. It's like mind boggling to me. We got together in high school and we're still together. It's been 17 years. That sounds insane to me. But also I don't remember, like I remember my life without him, but not really. I mean, we've been together for so long that like we literally went through all of our formative years together, grow growing up in all of the phases. Um, so yeah, this is not the anniversary I was gonna talk about though. The anniversary I was gonna talk about was that it has officially been one year since my mental health crisis since I started antidepressants and therapy and medication in general and just overall really working on my mental health. It has been one year. Can you even believe it? You probably can because it probably seems like all I talk about. And I'll tell you why it's all I talk about. Because it literally shifted and changed my entire life when I went through that. How could you not talk about something like that when it was such a big deal, you know? The crazy part is, is that we just got rid of so many, so many items of clothing and this is what we have left. And I wear like the same three things. Like I said, it's been one year. It was August of 2021. I, I think you guys all know the story, but I will have it linked up here if you guys don't know what happened. But most of you likely do. I'll give you the briefest version. It was August, um, I was postpartum. I was 10 months postpartum from having my son. I developed postpartum depression and anxiety after having him. Didn't realize that's what I had because I just thought that this is what motherhood was like for me, just like exceedingly hard and that I just struggled. Cause I've always had anxiety, but after having him, it just got like significant, like significantly worse. But I didn't even realize, cause when you're in it and it's you, it's not as easy to see as it is for other people. And in fact, some people told me they're like, like I was diagnosed with it and I was like, okay doc, sure. And so, <clears throat> at about 10 months, my son got sick. Um, he started vomiting and I, have severe health anxiety and it was untreated of course you know untreated anxiety and I had a mental health crisis I did not sleep for like almost seven days off and on I slept like I didn't sleep for two days and then I slept for one and then I didn't sleep for another two days and then I started losing my grip on reality I had to contact a therapist and immediately get on medication and fight for my literal life because I was I was at rock bottom it was my actual rock bottom that was one year ago and it was the most difficult Thing that I've ever gone through in my entire life and I want to talk about where I'm at one year later and just what I do to keep my mental health in check and to get better through all of that because if you've ever been through it you'll know that's why people talk about it if you have perfectly good mental health and you don't struggle at all with depression anxiety like ruminating really like catastrophic thinking you just wouldn't understand how life-alteringly horrific it is it's like actually living in hell every day but i've made huge strides in the last year to make it my number one priority my mental health is my number one priority because i cannot take care of myself my husband my son 
anything around me, work, family relationships, friends, none of it when I'm as bad as I was. So what did I do? Well, I immediately got on antidepressants at the recommendation of my doctor. Now, I know that there's new studies and stuff like that are coming out that say like, oh, serotonin weirdly has nothing to do with depression. <sighs> Interestingly, I am on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI or antidepressant, um, and I feel great. And in fact, it has changed my life in a significant amount of ways that it's kind of disappointing because everybody's like, I knew it. And it's like, maybe that is true for some people, but maybe it isn't true for others. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. All I know is I feel significantly better. And it's the one big thing that I've done. I started doing therapy three days a week. Now that's a significant amount of therapy, way more than most people need. Again, like I said, rock bottom. Like I was at like a, I don't think I'm going to survive this type of situation. And I needed to like throw myself in head first to my mental health and mental well-being. So I immediately started doing therapy three times a week. I still do two days a week. I reduced down probably like four or five months ago because it just wasn't necessary for me to do that much therapy still because I started getting so much better. Then I also have a couple of, well, quite a few other things that I do to keep myself in a good headspace between all of that. Like I've got my medication, I've got my antidepressants. I take um, Lexapro 20 milligrams and that's gonna vary for everyone. There's so many different antidepressants out there. I was super scared to take it. I also take lorazepam as needed, but I very, very rarely need any. And that's a benzodiazepine, which a lot of people really vilify them and make them sound like the worst things in the world. And they definitely can be, but it is one of those things that like, if I hadn't taken them, I don't think I'd be here today. Don't allow myself to Google. And those are my biggest things. Oh, and then another biggest thing for me, like one of weirdly, and a lot of people don't think of this as like a big part of mental health and helping themselves, but it is not allowing myself to isolate. So I naturally want to isolate myself when I get into these difficult times. But what's weird is that I find that if I don't hang out with people every single week, I start to go down into a negative headspace again. I have to be around people. And this does not just stand for just me. Like people have to be around people. We need community. As much as we might all feel like introverts and like we, we don't want to be around other people and yada yada, we need to. Whether we want to or not, it is like a, an essential human need. Some little jammies that my little kiddo's grown out of. This is gonna be a big theme of today. Like, gotta start putting things away. Like, he's not wearing these footy jammies anymore. I got him all these jammies from these little poo jammies. My kiddo loves Winnie the Pooh. Look. <laughs> he got his little poojies. They're gonna have to go in the bin. We save everything. Of course, I can't get rid of anything because I'm a sentimental mama. I have to be around people. It is extremely important to me to, like I said, keep my mental health doing as well as it can and that means social connection and i honestly i'm not even kidding like for the longest time i was like i don't need that i don't even really like being around people that much it's not about like it's like a core need and i think that we don't even realize how much isolation can hurt us and during the pandemic especially i feel like a lot of us well not all a lot of us almost all of us it, it, we isolated because we had to it really affected a lot of people's mental health so that is a really big part of it is that i need to make sure that i'm always getting out of the house like going to the nursery and talking to random people going to the store talking to random people going to my dad's house hanging out with my sister hanging out with my friends doing play dates with babies like go 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 we need constant people interaction and when i have times where i'm not i can tell i can absolutely tell in fact this last week i um was sick my husband was sick and my son is sick so we haven't had any human interaction because you don't go around people when you're sick i've noticed that it's been a little more difficult for me i'm, I'm getting on edge a little bit more and just all that so that was a really big one for me and not googling so i haven't googled health symptoms in a year and that was probably one of the biggest things that changed things for me so i have like i said health anxiety you might know it as the term called hypochondria and that term has a lot of negative connotations to it when people hear you're a hypochondriac you're just worried about nothing when you say i have health anxiety it's like oh you're concerned about death and dying one has a negative connotation and the other doesn't so i like the term and so does my therapist health anxiety and that's what i have basically the concern with health anxiety is that anything that you feel in your body like if i feel my heart racing 
I go to a heart attack in my mind if I feel if like my boob has like some firmness to it And that could even be because I'm like breastfeeding still and like milk and stuff like that I go to breast cancer if I start to have a tickle in my throat I have pneumonia like you go to the worst case scenario every time and it used to just be for myself and my husband and then I had kiddo and my mind immediately places that anxiety onto him so now instead of it just being like i have cancer it's my son has cancer and that can be really debilitating because kids get sick and kids get bruises and kids get just so many different things because they're always falling they're always running into things they're grumpy they're fussy they drool their teeth come in like they're just a mess you know <laughs> and with my mama heart it was a it's a recipe for worse anxiety so having health anxiety is rough because bodies have a lot of sensations and sometimes those sensations make my mind go wild like i said it's been a year and interestingly my therapist went on vacation this week right on the 29th was my year anniversary of my mental health crisis and the 29th is when she went on vacation and she was like this is so interesting that i'm 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 going away like on the anniversary of this trip and she sets me up when she leaves to go on like a vacation which i think she's only done like one other time and she sets me up with like here if you need a, the, the mental health crisis line it's here if you need another therapist i have a recommendation for you and i told her before she left she was like do you think that you need his contact information i said i'll be fine i'm gonna be just fine well when she went on vacation day one i started getting a scratchy throat <laughs> forget i have health anxiety so i immediately am like i have covid i have covid and i start freaking out i could feel myself going into a panic now last year when i went into that panic and i started getting scared of illness scared of my son getting sick scared of all of that stuff happening i had a full-blown mental breakdown i didn't sleep for days on end i lost 20 pounds in two weeks like i literally was a shell of myself as a human being because of the fear of what could happen and this time because I actually started getting sick again one year later, I could feel myself going down that same path. So what did I do differently? What did I learn in this last year? No Googling. Last year, when my son was vomiting and I was concerned, I was Googling. I convinced myself that he had cancer. And that sounds crazy, but that's just what it's like. Health anxiety will take you to the worst case scenario every time. And I convinced myself of it so much so that I couldn't sleep for days on end. And it wasn't even real. He literally threw up for two hours and then it was perfectly fine. But myself, I was not only not fine, I was in a state of fight or flight that took me like a month and a half to get out of. Like literally took medication therapy, medication to sleep. Like it, it sent me on a spiral that I've never been on before. And this time I cannot have that happen again. So we've got the same scenario going on again, but now Christy's sick. And I've been sick since the beginning of, since 2019. So what did I do? I took half of a lorazepam because I don't want to let myself get into that spiral again. I'm not telling everyone to take medication. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is what I did for myself and this is what Christy wouldn't do before. I was so scared of medication, going through my breast milk and hurting my son or making him sick or this and that. I wouldn't do any of that stuff because it was like a, I need to suffer so that he's healthier. But then I realized, and after talking to my therapist, talking to my doctor, him having a healthy mom who's not spiraling and having an absolute mental breakdown every single day is way more important than the negligible amount of lorazepam that he may or may not get through my breast milk. And spoiler alert, I've never noticed anything at all ever. He's a perfectly developing child. In fact, he's very smart. Like. This child is too smart. <laughs> he talks constantly. He says everything. I started off with that because I could feel myself immediately starting to spiral in a really, really bad direction. Then what did I do? I didn't Google. I told myself, if I get concerned enough, I will go to my doctor. And that is something that we worked on in therapy a lot. And that is the fact. So my mind always tells me like, this is a worst case scenario. You're gonna get really sick. You're gonna do this, that, that. Like if I feel a pain in my lower right side, instead of being like, oh, I just have gas or something. I'm like, I have appendicitis. So what we learned in therapy is if you are concerned that you have appendicitis, you would go to the doctor, right? You would go to the doctor. You're not gonna sit at home if you think you, your appendix ruptured. So do you actually think it's appendicitis? No, then you can't worry about it. Because if you were worried enough about it, you would go to the doctor. And that right there has been one of the biggest helps to me. I don't get a Google because Google doesn't have the answers for me. What happened to somebody else has no effect on me. It may or may not 
but they Google can't tell me. It could tell me a million things that it could be, but it cannot tell me if it is for sure in me. Who can? A doctor. Are you concerned enough to go to the doctor? No? Then you can't worry about it. Let it go. And that right there is so helpful for me because it's so true. I'm not gonna let myself have a ruptured appendix and die. So do I actually think it's a ruptured appendix? No, because if I did, I'd be at the doctor right now. So stop worrying about it, you know? And that's a really, really helpful tool for me. So I, I thought of those things and then I told myself the facts. I have a scratchy throat. I have a sore throat. And then my mind started going to all these places of things that could happen to my son. If I was concerned, I'd go to the doctor. I must not be concerned enough because I'm not at the doctor. So you can see how I have to work my way through it with all the steps that we've learned in therapy. And those are like the helpful cognitive behavioral things. Like it's a thought and a behavior. If you were concerned enough, you would go to the doctor. You're not, so you won't. End of story. You don't get to sit and ruminate on it anymore because you're clearly not that concerned about it. Okay, perfect. And it really helps me. Um, what else do I do? So uh, those are my thoughts and my, and my patterns that I go about. And then, so that was me with getting sick. I also realized I took a couple of COVID tests negative. I did not have it. And then I thought, colds still exist, okay? I could still do everything that I normally wanted to do around the house. I could still water the garden. I could still, I went outside, I picked blackberries. I painted my son's bedroom. I actually was super productive. I clearly wasn't so sick that I was like, you know, stuck in bed. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have anything like that. I just didn't feel very good. I had a stuffy nose and a sore throat. I had to look at the facts and not extrapolate them out into what I thought was going to happen, which didn't end up happening. So then a couple days later, I'm starting to get over my illness and my husband and I get some food from a local restaurant and we're, we're both eating lower carb right now. And it is this dish that is made with stevia and we've eaten stevia before, no problem. So my husband eats this whole dish of food and an hour later, he is literally head to toe covered in hives. Head to toe, like hives, raised, itching more than he's ever itched in his life. And then his throat starts to close. And then he starts wheezing and his breathing literally sounds like <clears throat> And I was like, so my therapist goes on vacation, I get sick at the anniversary of a mental health crisis and my husband has freaking like, um, I would call it a mild to medium allergic reaction, potential anaphylaxis from this food. So we load him full of Benadryl and he's okay. But for 14 hours, he's like struggling, like literally covered in hives. And I was like, do you wanna go to the hospital? And he was like, let's just wait it out, see what goes on. And he started getting better and better with lots of Benadryl. Next day, totally fine. That morning after my husband wakes up, I wake up with my kiddo and he is burning hot to the touch and he has a fever. <laughs> I laugh because I cried and he has his first fever. Now I know it almost two years old to have that be the first fever. That's actually pretty good. I know a lot of kids get sick quite often, but my son hadn't. Thank God, other than that pukey time, he hasn't had a fever. Well, he has 101 fever and I am just like, you really are giving me your toughest battles, aren't you? You know, it honestly did feel like life was like, you know what, your therapist is on vacation. This is the moment you've been training for. <laughs> you, you've got to use all of your coping skills right now. Everything that you've learned in the last year. And I will say, I am so thankful for therapy and medication because my son had a fever and I, I really like all of the fears, all of the things that I've been afraid of came true on, on this time. My, my husband throat started closing. My child got a fever. I got sick. And I'm so glad that all of it happened because it showed me that my anxiety was in fact a liar. Everybody's okay. My son's fever is gone. He's snotty, but he's fine. He's grumpy, but he's fine. Me, I got sick, I'm fine. My husband, allergic reaction. He's fine. It shows me that not everything is worst case scenario always. Sometimes kids can get sick and just have a cold. Sometimes I can get sick and just have a cold. Sometimes my husband can have an allergic reaction and get over it. And not everything is a death sentence. And my mind has told me 
that it is, especially with the pandemic. I mean, I, every being inundated constantly with the news of death and dying, I mean, all day, every day for years and being locked in our homes and being just, it's just, it's a fear that, that has been very real, you know? And my mind has always told me that illness means death. And this last week has shown me that, that that's not true. And I'm so, so grateful for it. I cannot even begin to describe how grateful I am to be through it <laughs> and to have it be okay. Like it's okay. And um, therapy and medication and working on my mental health and putting all of the things into practice that I've been doing for the last year have made such a significant difference on my mental health and this last week that I could shout it from the rooftops. If you're struggling, and you don't want to get help because you don't think it can work, hello, I am uh, perfect proof that that is your anxiety lying to you. <laughs> you can get better, and I am proof of that. Do I still have anxiety? Yes. Did it ruin my life this time? No. And last time, it was literally 50 out of 10 bad. I was pacing around the home because I went into like a severe state of fight or flight, and I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't use any coping skills to get out of it. I had let myself go too far, but this time with everything I've learned in therapy and everything that we work on every week, I did not spiral. I did not panic. I didn't let myself get to that because I have the power. I have the ability to not do that. Now I have the skills and if I can't do it or I'm too in it, medication is there and it's not always evil. I, I really vilified medication. I really thought that it was not going to help me. I didn't believe it. I did not believe that I would be somebody that medication would help and that I would be somebody that didn't feel fear around taking it because I was so afraid of medication like making my personality weird or taking away a part of me that like I thought my personality was anxiety you know what I mean I was like well that's who I am no I'm still exactly the same I'm still a worrier I'm still an anxious person it just doesn't control me anymore I can now let my husband drive I couldn't do it before I can go in situations I was afraid of I can sleep when my child is sick. I can wake up and enjoy my morning without worrying about everything. I can feed my son without constantly being afraid that he's going to choke. I'm not hyper vigilant anymore. I'm still vigilant, but I'm not hyper vigilant. And that is how it has changed my life because it has taken the cripplingness away from my anxiety. And now I'm just a regular lady. I'm a regular anxious mom with regular anxious mom thoughts of like being concerned for my child's well-being, you know, like that's all normal stuff. And you're never gonna get rid of all of it because it's part of the human experience. Like we're not meant to get rid of all of it. Tractor, my kid is obsessed with cars and tractors. I cannot even tell you. Didn't even mean for that to be a thing. Like it just, it's like he was born and loved cars. <laughs> like the second he was born, he was like, that was one of the first noises he made when he could. It's just miraculous to me that I, a year ago, would not have believed you if you told me that, you, that you're that you gonna be okay. Like you're gonna be okay one day. Not only didn't believe you, I was certain you did not know what you were talking about and everyone else can get better, not me. And I'm here to tell you that was anxiety lying to me and that you can get better and you will get better. And even if what you've tried so far hasn't worked, there is always something that can work. And I hated hearing people say this kind of crap because I was like, you don't know me or my life, okay? You're not my real dad. And I just didn't think that people understood how bad I felt because when they would say stuff like this, I'm like, yeah, okay. You clearly have less anxiety than me because you're saying words like this. Like you, you don't know how bad I feel. And you know what, they might, but I didn't realize that I was making myself miserable by doing things that were causing misery, like Googling. I didn't think that just simply Googling could do that much. Oh baby, when I tell you, it was almost the reason I had anxiety it was because I was allowing myself to put myself in situations that literally were not real or true. When I stopped allowing myself to do that, and I actually don't just stop myself from doing it, I set blocks on my phone. I go into my screen time controls, in my phone and set app limits. And one of those being like, you can set app limits for yourself. And then what you can do is you go in there and you 
tell it to give you only one minute per day on certain websites. So mine is like Healthline, Mayo Clinic, anxiety.com, all those things. I was reading constantly about having anxiety and about this and about that and about this and what does this mean and this pain in my finger and my fingers feel numb and my anything that I felt, I was making it so. I would feel worse because anxiety has physical symptoms as well. So when I would start to feel a symptom, I would Google it and then I would start to feel more symptoms and I would start to feel more and I would start to feel more. And most of that was probably in my head. And it's not to say that some of my health problems aren't real. I have real legitimate diagnosable health concerns. It's like that saying, I just posted it to my story the other day. It's like, I've had a lot of worries in my life most of which didn't happen or something like that. It's like a Mark Twain quote, I'll have it up on the screen. And it's so true. Like it, it's not that my life has actually been filled with that much turmoil, but it has been. It's so interesting. And most of this stems from um, the death of my mom when I was 16. I had a relatively average worries before that. I don't think that I was overly worried about much. And then my mom died at a really young age and it was a really horrific, horrific, horrific death and just absolutely brutal to watch. And she was so young, she was only 40, 43 or 44, I can't remember. And um, I just worried about everything. I don't wanna leave this earth. I realized how final death really is and how it changes everything once you're gone. I mean, it's just life altering in every way and I just wanna live here for a very long time. Then I had my son and he became the literal air that I breathe. I mean, he's the most important thing to me in this world and I couldn't have anything happen to him. And so it feels in a way, being hypervigilant is actually helping. When it, it's really not, it's, it's hurting because it doesn't actually stop anybody from getting sick. It stops you from living your life. That's what I was doing. I wasn't living my life, I was living for fear. I was, I was holding myself up for fear of anything. As like pathetic as it is to use a quote from Nemo, it's like Dory says to Marlin, because I was very, very Marlin before, like worried about everything. And it's like how Dory says, well, you can't never let anything happen to him. Otherwise nothing will happen to him. Something along those lines. And it's like, so true. Like, I don't want to block myself from everything. Otherwise I'm gonna do nothing. And then what did I live for to be afraid? That's not living. And so I li feel like I live now, we do things now. I, I was so, so worried about sleep schedules and having things be thrown off and what if I don't get it blah, 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 to the point where it was absolutely ruining my life. Like I wasn't living at all, just living to worry about everything. So here I am today, one year post mental health crisis and I'm gonna keep doing therapy three or two times a week. I'm not doing three times a week. I'm gonna keep doing it two times a week and I'm gonna keep up on this. I'm gonna stay on medication and I don't know how long I'm gonna be on medication or if it's a lifetime thing for me or if it's something that, you know, I'll be able to get off of one day. Right now, I am in no hurry to get off of it. I am thinking about it in the way of like, am I gonna have more kids? Is it something I could stay on if I'm pregnant? Is there long-term consequences for the baby if I did have another kid? I don't know any of that and I'm also not trying to worry about that stuff right now because it's not my immediate reality. I'm not pregnant and I'm not trying to get pregnant right now. So I don't need to be stressing about that right now. Something that I'll revisit in the future if I need to. So, and I'm here to tell you, you know, I know it seems like I harp a lot about mental health, but like, here's the thing. When you, like I said, when you've struggled with it and when you've actually felt what it feels like to be trapped in your own mind, you, re you recognize that a reality exists that you didn't know exists. It'd be like if you were in the matrix and then you come back into regular life, you want to tell everybody like, bro, this place exists. And then they're like, what? And stop talking about it. And you're like, no, you don't understand. Because if you don't understand, it's like, it's a reality. It's so scary because it's almost like I experienced what it's like to live in hell and you wanna tell people like, bro, you don't wanna go there. But if you ever do, here's how to get out. <laughs> it, 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 uh, that's, what, that's what it feels like. Because it actually felt like I was living in a different reality on earth. Like I was living in an alternate dimension that I didn't know existed, but that was horrifying. Like 50 out of 10 horrifying. And I never wanna go back there. So I'm not going to if I can avoid it. And that is, that's it. So yeah, if you are in it right now, I, I all I can say is I swear to God on my life, I did not ever believe I would be sitting here doing my laundry on YouTube in a 30 minute video talking about how much better I'm doing. And I am here.
and I am doing better and I don't feel afraid to say that. A year ago, I was like, I'm never going to feel better. And not only do I feel better, cause for the first like six months, I had to take lorazepam every night to sleep. Maybe it was like eight months. I had to take it every single night to sleep. I was so afraid that one week of not sleeping fucked me up so bad that I had to take it every night to fall asleep. And then you know what? I'm not on it anymore. And I've only taken a half of one in like the last couple of months. And I, my fear was I'm gonna get addicted to them because so they always say like you can so easily get addicted to them. And some people can, yeah. And some people do get addicted to them. I didn't. Again, I was using other people's experiences as my own and thinking that that was gonna be my reality when it wasn't. And you know, it is always a concern. You need to talk to your doctor about it because you know your history and you know yourself and situations like that more than I do. I'm some lady on the internet. This is all, you know, conversations that you need to have with your doctor. But the reason I harp on about it so much is because if you're struggling and you feel like you're all alone in it, you are so not. And not only are you not, but the more I talk about this, the more I realize how many people struggle and just don't say anything. And that is, you're right. You know, you don't have to talk to other people about what's going on in your life. But if you feel like the people you're watching are like doing absolutely incredible, some of them might be, but a lot of them might not be. And they just might be too afraid to talk about it or they don't want to talk about it. Or it's, it's hard to open up about it because people are very judgmental. Every time I talk about this online, the amount of people that come out of the woodwork that are like, this has changed my life or I got on medication and this has been the most helpful thing. I was so afraid and I had nothing to be afraid of or I went and talked to my therapist or I went and talked to my doctor. Like those messages are countless. I get those messages every single day and that is why I continue to talk about this even though I get so much criticism for doing this as well. The amount of criticism that I get, Man, if you could fucking read my DMs, they are brutal, 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 mean, 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 mean stuff that people say. But again, I don't say stuff for them. And you know what? That just shows me it's a oh, sad day that talking about your struggles can make people hate you and make people dislike you. But I think it's, it's more of a reflection on them, you know? I mean, I can't imagine sending somebody a hateful message after they talk about having anxiety and depression, but you know, to each their own. People have their own shit that they're going through. It's just, you know, fuck off my page. But what I will say is I'm not gonna stop talking about it because of that, because if there was somebody out there who just needed to hear it, like I needed to hear it when I was so deeply in it, like, hey, I'm right here and you're not alone and it is that hard and people might make you feel like you're a whiner or like you're complaining or like you have nothing to be depressed about. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how much love and support you have. Mental health does not discriminate. Like, I, okay, so here's a really, really interesting, I was listening to a um, podcast the other day. The dude was talking about how like, um, brain chemistry, he was like a neuroscientist. And he was talking about how when they were looking in the brain of somebody they were that actual like anger can be stimulated in the brain um, based on like stimulating neurons in the brain and he was talking about how they like keep people awake during this and they like put an electrode in the person's brain and then the person will say what they feel so they're like oh my gosh i'm suddenly feeling so angry and they'll know where in the human being's brain anger is formed and i guess that just goes to show me that for people who are like Mental health is, you know, quit talking about mental health, it's not that deep, just get over it, all this kind of stuff. The brain, which we all have listening to this, I'd hope. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but the brain is such a complex thing that where actual physical neurons in your brain determine anger and fear and love and connection and so when people are like discounting mental health or they're like, shut up about it. If I poke a part of your brain, you're gonna feel mad. We can turn on and off these feelings that we feel in our brains. And every one of us, every one of you watching this right now has mental health or mental illness or mental well-being. We all have it in there. It's just how we've come to deal with it or handle it or the, the, the pathways that our brains have created for these neurons, we all have it. And so we need to be talking about it because it's the most relevant thing. There was this, um, he was talking about on there that there was this dude who, this was like back, maybe back in like the 1800s. And there was this dude who got shot in the head with, it was like some car backfired or blew up or something like that. A really hot pipe 
flew through the prefrontal cortex of this dude's brain and it cauterized as it went in so it like essentially blew a hole through his head and blew out his prefrontal cortex and how in that it it cauterized as it went through so he wasn't like bleeding to death and of course they didn't know how to handle that back in like the 1800s so he just continued like living his life after that and the the point i'm trying to make through this is a portion of this dude's brain was removed and he was like a really kind compassionate empathetic dude before this and after a portion of his brain was removed he became violent he became aggressive he was a completely different human being because a part of his brain was gone and that shows me that the brain <laughs> Each part of it matters and can be shaped and molded with our behaviors and thoughts and patterns. And I mean, obviously physically removing a part of it too, but it boggles my mind how little emphasis is put on brain health with therapy and all of this stuff and rewiring these neurons with behavior and you know talk therapy and things like that. And how much is put on pull up your bootstraps, get over it, stop crying. And like all of these things matter so much. Like mental health matters arguably, I'm not saying more than physical health, both matter. But I'm just saying, I feel like we put a lot of emphasis on physical health only and not so much onto mental health. And then when people talk about it, it's like, oh my God, get over it. And it's like, holy shit, dude, it matters so much. And once you realize and recognize how much it did matter, it makes you wonder why we don't have universal mental health care. Like why that is not, of utmost priority in the world. And it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And I, I don't know, man, I'm just recognizing as time goes on how shitty it is, how much it's kind of looked down upon and how how much people just sort of write it off. And you know, it's just, it's just sad, man. So if you are, in it and trying to work on it you're not alone or you're not only not alone but every single person watching this has a brain and should care about it it's hard especially when therapy isn't covered by insurance i have to pay out of pocket you know and i'm so grateful so unfathomably grateful that i have the ability to do that because i don't know where i would be right now if i didn't uh, it's so devastating to me that it isn't widely available for people like it just actually makes me sick to my stomach to think how many people suffer without help because they make it impossible to get help i know that in my city um or in my county i think most people's counties probably have a free mental health crisis line i didn't realize that we did but like it's 24 hours a day mental health crisis line and i wish i had known about it when i was going through my struggles i didn't feel like it was really easy to find that information online just so you know, you may have one. So maybe look up like crisis line in your like county and see if anything comes up because apparently we have one and it's really good and useful and helpful. And all of the people on that line are like volunteer trained professionals. So that is this video today. I, I hope it was it resonated with anybody and was helpful for anybody. Again, I want to apologize that I'm always talking about mental health. It seems like something that shouldn't have to be talked about this often, but again, it is an on, it's an ongoing thing. It is not something that ends. It's not something that I'm like, all right, and my mental health was fixed. So I never have to talk about it again because it's not something that just stays fixed. It's something you have to work on every single day. And it's like, sometimes it's exhausting how much I have to care about it, but it is um, really, really life changing and has really improved my quality of life. And I just wanna be here to be um, somebody that is here to encourage you if you're in that same position. So, all right, well, that's it for today. I did all my laundry. I got it all folded. It's all right here. It's shocking how much less room it takes up when it's actually out of baskets. And I'm gonna go put it all away when my kiddo wakes up from his nap. So, all right, well, I thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this was somewhat helpful for you. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you at my next video.